Welcome to Weapon Wars, a video series where we look at some iconic weapons and then we examine how they're replicated in many different video games. And today we're examining the Mauser C96. But as always, let's start with the history of this weapon first. The Mauser C96 started off life as the Construction 7.63. The 7.63 obviously is the caliber in which the gun was chambered. And even though the gun would eventually bear the Mauser name, it had a tough road getting there. Around 1890, the weapon started as a passion project for three brothers who worked for Paul Mauser, the Fidel brothers, Fidel, Frederick, and Yosef. Even though Fidel was a higher up in Mauser's workshop, the pistol was designed largely without Paul Mauser's knowledge, and when he was made aware of it, the pistol development continued without his support. But in 1892, with the invention of what many at the time called self-loading pistols, what we would now refer to as semi-automatic, and with the commercial success of the Borchardt C93 pistol, the strange little pistol developed by the Federo brothers started to gain some interest in Paul Mauser's eyes. And in 1896, with the design finalized, Paul Mauser put the weapon into production originally marketing as the Mauser Military Pistol. This early version of the Mauser C96 featured an internal box magazine that could hold up to 10 rounds via stripper clip located forward of the trigger well. The weapon was chambered with a 7.63 by 25 millimeter Mauser cartridge. This round would actually hold the record for 30 years for the highest velocity pistol cartridge until the invention of the 357 Magnum. Combining this cartridge with the abnormally long barrel of the Mauser C96, a length of five and a half inches, the Mauser C96 would actually boast superior range and penetration compared to most pistols of its era. But in spite of the weapon's impressive performance, Paul Mauser was unable to secure any large military contracts, although the weapon did garner support from many British officers, including Winston Churchill. That was, of course, until the outbreak of World War I. The first major order came from the Austro-Hungarians who ordered the gun relatively unchanged, although a small minority of the guns were rebarreled for 8mm gas rounds. But the largest order that Mauser would receive for his C96 would come from the Imperial German Army. As production slowed on the Luger P08, a suitable replacement was needed. But due to the commonality of the 9mm parabellum round in the Imperial German Army, the C96 would have to be rebarreled. Thus was born the Red 9 version of the C96. To help prevent soldiers from accidentally loading the wrong type of ammunition into this version of the C96, many of the guns were burned and then painted with the Red 9. Although this was not universal, there are some C96s that have no burn marks in the broom handle, and some that are even painted different colors other than red. But even with the end of World War I, the pistol nicknamed the broom handle because of its unique shaped pistol grip could not be stopped. With all that said though, Mauser did have to make some design changes to the pistol to be in compliance with the Treaty of Versailles. One of the biggest changes introduced in the Treaty of Versailles for firearms, the German people weren't allowed to have pistols that had barrels longer than 4 inches, and they could not be chambered in the popular 9mm cartridge. This led to models like the 1921 Mauser. This was still the C96 design, but it had a much shorter barrel at 3.9 inches, and it was re-chambered to the 7.63 by 25mm Mauser cartridge. And you may have heard of the model 1921 Mauser under a different name, the Bolo Mauser. It was named the Bolo Mauser due to its popularity with the Bolshevik government, and later the Red Army. The Bolo Mauser had a really successful commercial run all the way into the 1930s, about the same time the German people really stopped caring about the Treaty of Versailles. This was made evident by the Model 1930 Mauser, still a C96 platform, but this one went back to the 5.5 inch barrel that the gun originally had. And in 1932, they even made a rapid fire version of the weapon known as the Model 712 Schnellfire. And even though official production of the weapon would stop in 1937, many copies were made around the world, notably in Spain and China, and whatever alien made Han Solo's D11 44 heavy blaster pistol. But now that we examine the history of the C96, let's go ahead and look at the games that replicated them. And today we're going to be looking at the World War I game series of Verdun and Tannenberg and EA's 2016 installment of Battlefield, Battlefield 1. And let's first compare the visual recreation in both games. And of course, with the Frostbite engine, Battlefield 1 as a whole looks absolutely stunning, and the model of the Mauser C96 is not really any different. And what you're seeing here is actually a slightly less detailed version of the weapon because this is the third person model. As you can see here, there are no tangent sights modeled in the third person view. Uh, this is one of the ways they, you know, 
improved performance, uh, but it is still a very detailed model even with that said. And to illustrate that, you can see in the weapon that you have all these machining lines and grooves cut into the weapon, which the weapon actually has in reality, as you can see. But something that also caught my eye is on the right side of the weapon here, you see there's a clear stamp on here, and that is actually on the weapon in reality. In reality, it should say Waffenfabrik uh, Mauser, which roughly translates into the Mauser Arms Factory, and then below that directly, it should say Obendorf a Neckar, so the Mauser Arms Factory at the Obendorf Factory on the River Neckar, since there is multiple Obendorfs. Also another thing I want to point out in this third person view, on the barrel left of the chamber you also have the serial number stamped on there, which is what it's supposed to be. It should be a 6 digit serial number, which it definitely appears like it is. But if we go to the back side over here on the hammer, we should have a partial serial number, which this one does have a serial number stamped on here, but it does not match up with the one that is on the barrel. So this poor German soldier has a mixed match C96. But that same soldier will be pleased to know that he does have a slot cut into his pistol grip for the detachable buttstock slash carrying case for his weapon, which was appropriate for the C96 at this time period. Now jumping over to the first person view, we can see some interesting information about the C96's tangent sight. An amazing little detail that they got right in Battlefield 1 is that the tangent sight actually goes out to a thousand meters, but it skips the 900 meter mark. And if we slow down and go frame by frame here, you can see that nowhere on there is a 900 900 meter mark, which is true to life to the real C96. Now let's jump over to the World War One game series of Verdun and Tannenberg. Unfortunately, with Verdun and Tannenberg, you don't have the third-person view where you can spin the gun and look at it all sorts of different details like you do in Battlefield 1. But luckily, we do have some renders that we can look at the weapon, and then of course we can look at it in first person. And let's first look at the render of the Mauser C96. And this is why I absolutely love M2H and Blackmail games. They may be a small indie studio but man, they have a passion and a love for historical accuracy, and it really shows in this render. I mentioned in the Battlefield 1 model look uh, that on the right side of the weapon, you had the stamp where the, the Waffenfabrik Mauser should go with the Obendorf stamp as well. Uh, on this render, you can clearly see it there listed out just the way I said it should be. You got the Waffenfabrik Mauser uh, at the Obendorf factory stamped right there on the weapon. Much like the Battlefield 1 weapon, you can see all the machine marks on this weapon. Very detailed. Moving over to the left side of the weapon, on the barrel, you can see just like the Battlefield 1 weapon, we have the six digit serial number up there, but also, unlike the Battlefield weapon, we actually have the house proof stamp on the weapon just below that, which is accurate. And just like we did with the Battlefield 1 weapon, we're gonna slide on back to the back of the weapon looking at the hammer. You can see on here, like the Battlefield 1 weapon, once again, you have the partial serial number listed, three digits there, and then below that, you actually have the full serial number again, which the Battlefield 1 weapon did not have. This is stamped on the frame itself of the weapon. And there's one other detail on the back of the weapon here that I want to point out that is really cool because it narrows down the C96 to which version it is. If you look on the hammer, you can see it has a monogram for NS, which stands for New Safety. Because of this, we can narrow down which model M2H and Blackmail Games were modeling for their Mauser C96. And we can even go as far as say that this is the wartime commercial version of the Mauser C96 that was produced around 1912 to 1916 until they switched it up for the 9mm contract. And we could probably say the same thing about the Battlefield 1 Mauser C96 because it has things like the tangent sight which was introduced in this time range and also that it was chambered in a 7.63 cartridge. But the World War 1 game series model of this weapon gives you everything you need to know and it's a true recreation of this weapon during the time period. Now let's go ahead and examine Examine how a real life Mauser sounds when it's shot and how both of these games sound when they're shot. So what you're going to hear first is the real Mauser C96 followed by the Battlefield 1 version. So now moving on to the World War One game series. Once again, you're going to hear the real life version shot first, then you're going to hear the sound of the World War One game series game Verdun. Personally, I don't think either one of these sounds are all that much accurate, but there are things I do like from both of these sounds. The Battlefield 1 gun sounds do have a resonance to them. They have, the, you know, a certain something that make you feel like you're firing a weapon. It has an oomph. Whereas the World War 1 game series guns sound more like 
to the level of what you're shooting. So a rifle sounds like more like a rifle. A pistol sounds more like a pistol. You can tell the difference between them. I don't think either one's perfect, but there are so few games that are perfect when it comes to sound. Now, another thing I want to check out is the fire rate of these weapons. And first, we're going to start out with the World War One game series game, Verdun. So we're going to go ahead and set the clock here. As soon as the gun starts moving, we'll start the clock. And about a frame after it fires the last round, we'll stop the clock. And there we have it, where you actually choose to stop the clock can vary a little bit, but as you can see there, we clocked in Verdun's Mauser C96 at 2.6 seconds, which means we average around 2.30 to 2.50 depending on where you stop the clock at, uh, rounds per minute, not counting reload. Now we're going to do the same thing with the Battlefield 1 Mauser C96, although Battlefield 1 does give you the listed rounds per minute, but we're going to do the same thing just so it's fair. We're going to go ahead and set the clock and then start it as soon as the gun moves just like we did with Verdun. And there you have it, but once again you can stop the clock a little bit earlier or later although the Battlefield 1 animation does seem to have a little bit more of a clean cutoff compared to the Verdun one and it definitely seems a lot closer to the exact 2 second mark. So once again we're getting around 300 rounds per minute. Now next we're going to look at the real Mauser. And this can be pretty hard to determine with some weapons, especially older weapons like the Mauser C96. Because of their age, it's harder to find videos and people willing to shoot these guns as fast as possible. But thanks to amazing weapon channels like Hickok45 and Hickok45 and Sons, which are links in the description below, we do have access to such video and we can examine and time it. Once again, as soon as the weapon starts to move, we'll start the clock and stop it as soon as he is finished it's a lot more clear cut this way uh, so let's go ahead and get going And there you have it. It's actually pretty funny. He mentions that he uh, struggled there and you can see a little bit of a hang up. But it's funny because he almost exactly hit Battlefield 1's time and he got pretty close to Verdun's time without really trying. So it seems like both games definitely have a realistic rounds per minute built in. Once again, there is a link down below to Hickok 45 and Sun where this video came from and a link to this specific video. Definitely check it out. Really cool to see and watch them fire this weapon and talk about it themselves. And it's also a pretty cool story on how they got the weapon for their video so definitely check that out now finally the last thing i want to cover here is how both games handle the action of both of these weapons and if you're not aware of what action means in firearm turns it basically explains how the weapon loads locks fires extracts and ejects ammunition basically how the weapon functions now first starting with the world war one game series and we're done it's a little disappointing because they seem like they took the easy road out here watching the weapon fire and operate everything looks good up until the point you try to reload the game does not let you reload this weapon until the magazine is completely empty. And they go about the same operation with all the weapons that are loaded via stripper clips. I'm not sure if this was a design choice for balancing or just coding purposes, but this weapon can be reloaded when it's only partially fired. And that's where we jump over to Battlefield 1. They were a lot more braver with their action modeling, but they didn't get it right either. Unlike the World War I game series, you can reload the weapon without using a stripper clip and mid-magazine. But a couple issues arise when you do so. So we're going to look at the single round reload in Battlefield 1, while at the same time looking at World of Guns and what happens when we pull the bolt back. Now let's look at them both individually. So hopefully you noticed that when we pull the bolt back in Battlefield 1 to reload the one round, we don't eject a round, and no round is lost in our ammo counter. Whereas in World of Guns and in real life, when you pull the bolt back, if there is still a round in the chamber, it is extracted, then you'd actually have to put two rounds in to make up for the one you lost. It's a small detail, but it's interesting to see how both games manage it. One doesn't simulate it at all with the World War I game series, and then one attempts to simulate it but doesn't quite get it right. And there's a lot of small details that go into each and every one of these videos, and a lot of hard work and research that goes into making sure you have a nice assembled product, just like a firearm. And if you want to help support more videos like these in future videos that have to do with things like military history, military equipment, 
and how they're reflected in things like movies and video games. Please consider supporting our Patreon in the card above. If you don't have any money to throw that way, that is perfectly fine. You can support the video in other ways. You can do so by sharing and leaving a comment or leaving a thumbs up or thumbs down on the video. Every little interaction helps. But as always, I hope you guys enjoy this video and until next time, have a great one. Later.